Hello, people watching the YouTube replay. It's number theory time again. Um, if anybody's here live, oh, Neutrino is first. Hi, Neutrino. Uh, welcome back. The plan today is that I'm going to have another go at learning number theory. Uh, how are you doing? Hi, Herb. Good to see you as well. Good. Oh. oh, this is nice. I'm doing number theory again. I We had a go at some quadratic residues a couple of weeks ago. Hey, cool. Uh, it was it was mixed, mixed success. Um, not my greatest effort, but I found some different lecture notes. And sometimes that's the way. You know, find a different source, look at something else. Hello, thrice shy. Ah, oh, God. Got a proper team going here. Um, between the five of us, maybe we'll maybe we'll learn some number theory. <laughs> I've been in the Discord and Thrice Shy has been teaching me measure theory in the Discord. That's not quite accurate, um, but there's been a lot of measure theory in the in the Discord. There's a difference between teaching and learning, isn't there? Um, lots of measure theory has been going down. So I'm, I'm taking everything chill, one step back down to chill math, chill maths where. Some number theory might be here. Hi, Miles Nash. If you're watching one of these for the first time, then uh, how? How did you find one of these? Um, <laughs> seriously, how, uh, what's going on? Um, maybe you typed maths into Twitch uh, and this is what came up. I'm sorry. Uh, or maybe you're on YouTube and it got like weirdly recommended by the algorithm. Hi, Mary. Uh, I'm all right. I'm recovering, I think. Um, last week on the on the stream, I said I was becoming ill. I remember Zoe was here and a bit ill as well. Um, I remember that conversation, and then I got a lot more ill. <laughs> Took some time off work, recovered a bit, did a lot more work. Should have taken more time off work, I think. But hey, pro tip: if you're if you're ill, <laughs> take time to recover. Don't go straight back to doing loads of maths immediately. Um, speaking of, let's do loads of maths. Let's. It turns out I have a different, different definition of what chill is for different people. Oh, hi, Super Snowman. Almost missed you. Almost missed you in chat there. Hello. Oh, this is nice. Oh, computer virus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it spreads via Twitch. <laughs> That's what it means to go viral. Um, <laughs> pause to drink. <laughs> pause to drink water. Oh, my goodness. Right. Okay. Excellent comic timing we've got going. Um, because I mentioned it, I'll put the link in chat. Uh, there is a there is a fairly active Discord. Um, if anything, the Discord is, is better than the live streams. Um, uh, <laughs> the Discord lets um, you all talk to each other, I guess, even if I'm not live. If you would like to the experience of chat, but in a sensible format, not just Twitch chat and all the time, then there's an unofficial Discord for you. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. Right, what am I doing? I'm trying to learn number theory. I've got I've got different notes. These ones are by Vicky um, from 2011. Oh my goodness. <sighs> yeah, go on. Um, uh, um, so 2011, and back in this is these are lecture notes from a C course in Cambridge. The C doesn't stand from Cambridge, but uh, Cambridge. Um, so this is slightly before me, um, but I thought this would be a different take on number three. It's 24 lectures, which is more content than the Oxford second year number theory course. Um, this is this is sort of third year, but the idea of the C courses at Cambridge is there's very, very little prerequisites, uh, very few prereqs. Uh, the idea is that there's some courses in, in third year of Cambridge where you can study them whether or not you've done second year things. Yeah, Vicky studied at Cambridge and uh, taught at Cambridge uh, with, uh, she had appointments at, she was definitely at Murray Edwards for a bit. Yes. Um, uh, let's go, responses. Yes. No. Uh, go. Uh, somebody asked for a poll in chat. Who was it who asked for a poll? Neutrino asked for a poll in chat. There is a poll in chat. All the best people are where at Cambridge at some point. 
Again, you tree know. Um, my plan, I think, we will find out if this is too ambitious. My plan is to kind of skim through the first five lectures or so, um, five or six lectures. Um, the notes are laid out in this lovely way where uh, they, the lectures are numbered in the corner. So you can kind of simulate, um, we go to a lecture, the lecture starts, the lecture ends, we see what content there is, we revise it, and we move on to the next lecture. And after about five or six lectures, it's time to do an example sheet. Um, so we've also got the example sheets here. They're sort of problems. Um, thanks for the follow, Sally. What am I going to call you? You've got Sally at the start of your name, so I'm going to go Sally. <laughs> thanks for the follow, Sally. Um, we have a follower goal to try and get to 14 squared. And we are some way off 14 squared. Why did we set it at 14 squared? Can anyone remember? We set the target at 196. I remember it being a kind of running joke or meme at the time. I can't remember what the meme was. Probably I thought it was prime or something, you know? That seems to be how most of the running jokes were. You know, I, I, I'd have said something in prime. I'd have said something really stupid in passing, like 14 is prime, therefore 14 squared is also prime, or just something completely absurd like that. I was a staircase book. Yeah. There was something on a staircase. But, spoilers, is the staircase Fibonacci? I remember it being maybe a multi-perfect issue. Anyway, never mind. Hey, does Neutrino know Sully from... Oh, no, this is weird. It's always like people know each other in, like, real life, which would be weird. Or maybe it's the Discord. Um... Right, okay. I think I'm ready. Uh, my ambitious plan, I'll say that out. Fine. We're going to skim the first five lectures and then be brave and have a look at the problem sheet and see if we can do any of the problem sheet. Haven't been that brave before on stream, right? We've looked at some lecture notes before, including all of Galois theory, <laughs> but never been brave enough to try the question sheets. Uh, uh, good, right, okay. Right, Cambridge has this first year. So Cambridge calls their first year um, part 1A, um, and there's a review at the start to review some stuff, which I'm hoping we can skim in a second. We're going to learn about uh, modular arithmetic, uh, Euler's theorem, Fermat's theorem. I think that's Fermat's little theorem, and then Euler's version with the 5n in there. But, uh, you know, tricky. Uh, and we've got some, what have we got? Fundamental theorem of arithmetic. Good. Sorry, I just looked up because the poll's ending. I've learned I have to look. When the poll's ending, it just vanishes. I don't know where to find it. So I have to look. Yes as one, with five out of seven votes for zero to count as a natural number. So there we go, uh, zero in N, claim a proof, a democracy uh, via Twitch. There you go, <laughs> I love democracy. Uh, good, we're gonna learn the Chinese remainder theorem and the Lagrange's theorem, and something about primitive roots, not powers. Uh, let's put a little, Square at the end of our proof. There we go. Something I like about Vicky's lecture. Um, something I like about Vicky's lecture lecture notes is um, the very strict layout. Uh, definition, definition, claim, proof, lemma, proof, definition, definition, example, um, which we'll see throughout. And also the comments. Here's the note about comments down here. So past lots of this content, we're not going to do today. Um, what is that? I've never seen that before. And I've got it in white text on a white background, so we can't read it, but it's something about Neutrino and Tier 1 and Sally. I'm going to choose to believe that Neutrino... Oh, look. I can read it over here. <laughs> Always worth donating, by the way, because donations confuse me. Uh, and then you get to see just confused streamers. I think you've gifted a sub. It's their first gift sub in the channel, and I think the first any gift sub in the channel. I don't really know what that means, um, but thanks. Give us, give us, <laughs> give us one of those. Oh no, you have a little present next to your name as well. This is adorable. Does that count as a ha? Oh, well, that's nice. I didn't know you could do that. Can you gift Prime subs to other people? I don't even know if that makes sense. If you have Amazon Prime, you can have a free tier one sub 
um, which I think does something about does something about uh, something about adverts that I don't really understand. Um, I don't know if you can give that to someone else. Sorry, Twitch has just shown me an interesting panel as well. Um, uh, apparently, it's now a competition. <laughs> There's some sort of leaderboard that's a bit. I don't know if you can see this. Um, can I show you this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in my little chat box over here. Hey, look, this is how I see all of chat. Um, and Twitch, short attention span, excellent combination, love it. Um, it's what's this? Is this like neutrinos now like winning? I can take the number two spot if I gift some people subs. Fun. <laughs> if you ever wonder whether things could be more gamified, ask the Twitch, ask the Twitch staff to see if they can gamify it. You can see a leaderboard as well. Okay, Neutrino, not only are you friendly and nice, you are also winning. <laughs> Seems necessary. Right, good, okay. Um, I was about to tell you about Text in Grey, which is going to be slightly hard to read. Um, but these are little comments along the way that I think it just... Uh, Vicky's comments along the way are really helpful. Uh, they include things that are not true. I'll point at a couple of those in a way. Like things that you might like to think are true but are not true. There's no real good way of putting that in your notes otherwise, I think. Um, you can't really do not a lemma or would be nice if, or sometimes people put like warning or caution. Um, it would be nice if X, but that's not true. Um, Vicky does that through comments along the way. Okay, right. There's distribution of prime distribution of primes in this course, and things like uh, the divergence of one over p, which is something we worried about in one of the very first chill maths live streams. At a moment that was not very chill, we started thinking about the the sum of one over p for problems p, or maybe some function of that. I think we were trying to work out whether the uh, quotient in a multi-perfect number could be arbitrarily large. Anyway, never mind. Uh, if only we recorded these, I could watch them back and then I'd know what I was doing. Okay, any good lecture course starts with some definitions, uh, and I know some of these already. Uh, so natural numbers, ah, right, okay. Uh, Vicky's not gonna include zero as a natural number. Um, after weeks of playing the natural number game where it is, we're gonna have to get used to that, I think. Um, right, okay, and we've got divisors. A um, natural number is greater than one is prime, exactly when it's only positive factors. So this is prime in terms of its factors. Okay. Um, I've seen a different definition of prime to do with um, prime dividing AB. I'll try and keep this in mind. Um, um, sometimes people will split these into primes and irreducibles. Um, irreducibles being the ones that you can't break down as factors and primes being the ones that, ones that have this property that P dividing a product means that P divides one or the other. Um, I think for the natural numbers, it doesn't matter. Those are the same thing. We're gonna get there, maybe. Uh, we've got the prime counting function, which I think we've talked about on this show before, um, but it's gonna be counting how many numbers less than or equal to X are prime. So this, this hash means the size, I think, the size of this set. Yeah, cool, okay. Uh, things have got prime factors. So that's nice. There's a little proof by induction. This is cute. If you've just met proof by induction at school or college or whatever, then here's a cute little proof by induction that um, things have got prime factors. Might not feel like that needs a proof, but. I suppose what's the essence of this proof, right? Um, it's something like, there's a way to phrase this in terms of consider the smallest number that doesn't have any prime factors. Um, then if it is prime, um, it's got a prime factor itself. And if it's composite, then hmm, suspicious, look at those. What did you say about smallest? Yeah, I think it is strong induction um, because here it says n has a factor in this set of all previous numbers. So yeah, I think this is strong induction. I forget sometimes, but where's this sentence going? I forget sometimes, but no, no, no. I can't remember. I think strong induction and weak induction are kind of the same thing. 
this was definitely in my university course, which is why I'm very hesitant. Um, I think you can prove strong induction using weak induction, and you can definitely prove weak induction using strong induction. So I think they're the same thing. What on earth do I mean? <laughs> Never mind, let's move on. Uh, infinite degree primes, good. Uh, here's Euclid's proof. Yeah, it's the classic. It's the classic. Multiply them and add one. Good. And they're going to talk about distribution later on. Ooh. Ooh. That's a sort of contradiction sign that I haven't. I guess it's that one, but taller. Uh, good. Your choice of contradiction sign may vary. Uh, I've seen several, so some people do. Let me know in chat whether you do some sort of lightning bolt or some sort of double crossing out thing or something else that I haven't thought of for your proof by contradiction. Or well, sometimes I guess people write out it's a contradiction. <laughs> uh, but I've gone for different. <laughs> the, co the D colon one is brilliant. <laughs> Yeah, cool. I, I did right on that. Um, okay. Definition of the highest common factor, co prime, and I think we're going to do some, yeah, Euclid's algorithm and bazoo stuff. Put numbers doing the same job in the same place. And Vicky lies this out in columns very neatly. Side note this is slightly awkward to do in LaTeX. I think you want some sort of array. Some sort of array to make, make all the alignment very nice. Uh, the highest common factor is the last one zero remainder. So this is Euclid's algorithm in case you haven't seen it before. Calculates the highest common factor by looking for sort of the remainder when you divide the first number by the second. You take the big number first, I guess. You look at the remainder uh, and then it iterates because um, anything that divided both of them will also divide the remainder. A little bit awkward to see that, but if you move the 2 times 51 onto the left, then you've got two terms each of which are multiples of the highest common factor. So this thing, this thing is as well, and so on. That means when you repeat this down, 51 goes here, 15 goes to here, you iterate like that. You keep going down and you keep, you keep having, so this, the last thing that you see, the last non-zero thing that you see uh, is uh, definitely a factor of both. Um, Excuse me, it's the highest common factor. It's the highest thing because um, anything that divides, anything that divides both of them will also divide this. And crucially, this divides both of them. Working, you have to work backwards. Uh, excuse me, these last two lines, you can use these last two lines to prove that, aha, six is a multiple of three. And therefore, these previous lines, everything on the right hand side is a multiple of three. So 15 is a multiple of three. So you can read it, read it this way to prove that the final thing you've got is a factor of both of them. And you can read it this way to prove that anything that's a factor of both of them turns up down here. So that is the highest common factor. That's a very cool argument. Let's see if it's on the next page. Uh, ooh, here we go. Yeah, here we go. This is the proof, proof that it works. Proposition three, it just works. And then the, the formal statement. Yep, cool, okay. I think I've seen this before. It is interesting. I like, like explaining it all with these um, subscripts on for like the sequence of remainders is effort. It's work. Uh, okay, and Bazoo says you can solve equations like this if and only if the highest common factor of A and B divides C. Um, so it sort of obviously has to because it's going to divide everything on the left hand side, so it has to divide C. Um, and then you can reverse Euclid, Euclid's algorithm, I suppose run it and then reverse it. Oh, this is the this is the back substitution step where you take Euclid's algorithm, which gives you at the end of Euclid's algorithm you have an expression involving the highest common factor, which you can you can rearrange for highest common factor. This last remainder equals something, thing minus something else, um, and then you can run up the row of equations using each one to eliminate. Um, the remainder in preference of earlier numbers from your calculations. You kind of rearrange all of them. So you, you use down here, um, you use this line to write three equals something, this line to write six equals something, 
and this line to be 15 equals something. Um, and then you use those to kind of back substitute. You've got three equals some stuff. Uh, it's in terms of sixes and 15s, so he wants those. Uh, but I've got an equation for six equals and an equation for 15 equals, so I've got to plug them in. And you work from the bottom upwards. Uh, well, it's a good idea to work from the bottom upwards because your, your equation for six equals involves some more 15s, so you know, don't jump ahead. I uh, was just doing this. A cool to seen some of this. Brilliant. We are linking linking into where people currently are. So this is very nice. Unless you solve equations. Here's an example. What lovely. Ah, look. Here's the thing I really like. Right? I tried to explain this out loud. Okay, so example involved. Exercise. Proposition. Proof. Remark. Theorem. All the way through. Bam, bam, bam. What are we doing in this bit of notes? Lovely stuff. Um, okay. So here we go. This is the reversing. I was talking about here there's an equation for six in terms of this stuff um, here there's an equation for oh my goodness for 15 at some point this 15 has been replaced by this bracket and you end up with just stuff involving 117 and 51 that's good because now you've got numbers here 7 and negative 16 multiplying your numbers which is exactly what you wanted you wanted to find numbers to multiply by to give you a total of three uh, good okay Ah, right, proposition five. Aha! <laughs> we just, we, I foreshadowed this 10 minutes ago. Hooray! <laughs> um, uh, okay, okay. So I think I've seen a proof like this before. It's the sort of thing I would expect to see on a question sheet if it wasn't already in the lecture notes. Um, it's not terribly hard. So, aim to the p divides b. Um, and if P doesn't divide A and B is prime, then they're co-prime numbers. Yeah, so then bazoo, and then rearrange it. We got P all over the shop, using everything. It's a lovely fact. Over here, so we've got these small comments to show us that P divides AB is what's going on here. P divides this thing, P. Um, so P divides everything on the left-hand side. Um, and this is sort of... In some sense, it's quite a lot of work because hiding in there is all of Bazoo and all of Euclid's algorithm. So like the last two pages of lecture notes, uh, all this stuff about um, Euclid's algorithm and setting up what Euclid's algorithm is. Okay, fine, this last one page of lecture notes. <laughs> Um, all of that's in here, kind of condensed down into the word bazoo. Um, but that's also quite a short proof, but has some nice ideas in it. Anyway, um, okay, remark, this is a good illustration. Yes. Um, okay, a fundamental theorem of arithmetic, and this is about primes dividing products. Um, if you had an expression with different primes in it, or a different way to factorise your number, then um, the primes on the left would have to divide the product on the right, which is suspicious because of this P divides AB business. Um, is this what this says? Um, existence? Yeah, okay, fine. Um, everything's got a prime factor and then induction, that gets it down to something smaller. Uh, or if it's prime, you're done. Um, uniqueness? Uh, Suppose that these things match up, then Q1, the first thing on the right-hand side, divides the product on the left. That's suspicious. Um, so P I is prime. Yes. Okay, good. Um, cancel and repeat. You get different prime factorizations. Okay. Definition of modular arithmetic. Good. Or congruences first, I suppose. Um, oh, let's read this abstract bit. That looks like a good thing to read. My aim here is to try to skim through and see what we're doing and also try to get a little bit of a deeper understanding because I think a lot of these ideas I sort of know a bit but I can't do the next level of what, what's what's really going on. Like um, a couple of weeks ago in chat somebody said what well, if, if n is not prime what is the structure of the quadratic residues? What's the structure of the group of units mod n and I don't really have that kind of big picture um, so I'd like that good that's my plan 
Uh, we could do an example sheet in about half an hour. This is exciting. Um, <laughs> oh yeah, okay. It's an ideal. Yep, yeah, those are the only ideals of Z. Good, good times. <laughs> The cosets of the congruence classes coming from the equivalence relation, equivalent symbol. Hi, Super Snowman. Uh, we were looking at Bazoo. Uh, Bazoo lets you prove that if P divides AB, then P divides one or the other. Uh, proof up here. Very quickly, take your screenshots now. Um, and P dividing AB uh, gives you this kind of unique factorization. We've moved on to look at uh, this definition of congruence, um, and it's been defined in terms of ideals uh, as well for a sort of abstract look. Um, yeah, I think it just is what it is, right? <laughs> There's not much, not much you can say. Hello, Clarence. Ten. Have I ever interviewed an IMO applicant? I guess that would be. I guess you mean an applicant who's done the IMO. I'm not sure, I think I have. A bit tricky. If so, what were they like? I can't remember, I can't remember sorry. Um, I'm not certain I can remember which of the applicants I've interviewed done IMO stuff. Yeah, no, I definitely can't. I'm sorry. <laughs> I've interviewed a lot of people. <laughs> um, My interview questions are not very similar to IMO questions, if that's helpful. IMO people are definitely better than me at most sorts of mathematics, I think. Probably better than me at my interview questions. Uh, but I don't think it's as simple as you've been to the IMO and now everything else in life will be really easy. Um, Wish it were the case, right? That you do the IMO and then... Great, well done. Don't have to think at university, but unfortunately you do have to think at university as well. Um, uh, maybe something nice about IMO. People is that they've done a lot of work to get that far. And then they might be willing to do a lot of work afterwards. Nash Nash says, My few questions are more like primary school maths than IMO questions. I like basic maths. Um, not sure if I interviewed Mountain Ash, um, but I kind of know what they mean. You got square brackets now. Congruence class of three in the mod seven world. Yeah. We're interested in the quotient ring. What happens when you quotient by that ideal? Define this. Yep, the normal thing, I guess. Um, does that work because of the isomorphism theorem for ideals? Yeah, it's probably that, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Um, a, B, and integer go up to N. Okay, you can do an inverse. Wait, that's just... Yeah, this is just busy. You can solve this equation and find your inverse. Uh, uh, exercise, brilliant, we've got something to do. Um, A does not have a multiplicative inverse mod n if the highest common factor is bigger than 1. Um, okay, so what's going on here? I suppose um, I sort of want you to prove by contradiction, right? Suppose A, B, is equal to 1 plus kn. I'll do an equal to 1 plus kn for some b and n where uh, a b bigger than 1, the highest common factor, which I'll call d, then d divides a b and d divides kn because that divisor will yeah, divide a and it will divide n. Um, so D divides one, nonsense. Okay, which is exactly the same, right? It's just sort of reversible. Well, maybe not. Yeah, yeah, I've said too much. Okay, 
Oh, it's nice to have an exercise in here. Um, if it's prime, then everything has an inverse, except for... Is that what P that is a field? Right, everything except zero has a has an inverse. Good. What about fields on the stream at some point? Um, okay, multiplicative group is the group of invertible ele elements, mod n. It has to be the things that are co-prime, so we're going to write phi n, or va phi n. If anybody in chat is Greek, then I'm really sorry. Um, here's the two ways that mathematicians draw the symbol phi. Um, one of them's probably closer to correct than the other one, or closer to how Greek handwriting works, but maybe both of them are miles off. Um, okay, that's this is the number of things that are co-prime. Um, okay, if p is prime, then this is true, and phi of eight is four. The number of things co-prime to eight is four. One, three, five, seven. Um, I feel like I should know what phi of p to the k is. Is this coming up in a second? Let's quickly think about it. Things that are co-prime to p to the k. Oh, it's the things that aren't a multiple of p. That's the only way you could be not co-prime to p to the k. So what do I think this is? I think this is the number of things co-prime to p to the k is I want to divide something by p quite badly. Oh, can I share this doc? Yeah, where did I get this from? <laughs> so this is stu a student's copy. Um, my student went to the lectures, typed it up. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Bop. 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 There you go. Um, yeah, so things that are not properly co-prime. I think it's just p to the k minus one. So divide by p. I'm worried about being out by one <laughs> on my division. Right, let's count together. You start at one, that's co-prime. Two, three, four, up to p minus one. And then p, it's not co-prime. And then there's another chunk. So it's, yeah, very nicely set up. Very nicely set up to want to be. Uh, the website, if you get rid of the end of that URL, you can get to the Tartarus website, uh, org slash Gareth slash maths notes. Love notes. Um, I don't know if he still is, but uh, when I was a student, uh, Gareth was a professional uh, tutor or supervisor, say in Cambridge, um, he did a lot of uh, teaching on a lot of different courses and maintained notes on any course that he'd been to, I think. Um, helpful. Okay, I'm going to put a little question mark here because it's not officially in the course notes. It's me trying to do an exercise that I invented, which I think I've got right. I think I've got right. <laughs> okay, Fermat Euler. Oh, right, it's both of them at once. Sort of double act. Um, N be a natural number, yep, okay, A to the 5N is equal to 1 mod N. We're going to get, yeah, Fermat's little theorem as a kind of consequence of this. And the proof is good, because this is third year lecture notes, so they are allowed to just go wham, apply Lagrange's theorem to the group G is the units mod N. A is in the group, because A is co-prime. Yeah, scroll a tiny bit. A is co-prime, good. Okay, so A is in the group, so it's order divides the size of G. Um, good. Okay, uh, Thrushai thinks I'm right. <laughs> I'm true for the case P to the K equals 8. Yeah. It felt like the sort of thing I should know, and I haven't become that much more confident, but I'm still, I'm still going. Okay. Uh... Good. Okay, Lagrange's theorem says the order of any element divides the order of the group. Uh, I'm not going to talk about that now. If you're doing group theory in further maths these days, this is not the true not true when I was at school. But I think these days, if you're doing further maths and if you're doing group theory, then I think you get as far as Lagrange's theorem. I'm not sure they tell you about this group of units. They don't tell you about this group, do they? Um, 
things with multiplicative inverses mod n, the group of all the things. Right, so Lagrange is another FP2 module, says Herb. Okay, Lagrange's theorem, but maybe not applied to this group? Or are you telling me that this group is in another FP2? Oh no, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> it's a cool, cool theorem. Um, all three of these are cool theorems, I think. Um, okay, we somehow missed the lecture two's note, but we're now ready for lecture three, I think. Oh, you were wrong, I'm not correct. I, don't say you were wrong, the previous thing was you telling me I was correct. <laughs> you leave me hanging as well. <laughs> right, okay. Oh. Oh. You want me to subtract? Oh, that'd be annoying with the 8 case up here. They do coincide for P equals D. <sighs> yeah, no, hmm. Yeah, I think I am wrong. Neutrino says that sounds so cool, I wish we had something similar. Are you doing a different sort of qualification, Neutrino? Or just different sort of further further pure splits into all of these or further sorry further mathematics splits by example okay so I didn't think hard enough right I, I spotted that every pth element is a multiple of p but those are the bad ones those ones are the multiple of p I want, I want all the other stuff right I want most of the stuff uh, Cool, so I should multiply this by p minus 1, right? Yeah. Oops. Oh, we know this, don't we? We do this all the time in multi-perfect numbers, right? <laughs> then we have, like, we'll throw in, a, throw in a 9, and we'll have to worry about the 13 over, 13 over 9 factor that you get from throwing in a 9 into a multi-perfect number. Back when we did all those calculations. And um, about 13, what is that 13 then? It's not 9 times 8, it's not 3 times 8 either. What am I doing? What is this? 1 plus 4 plus 9? No idea, that's the sum of the fact it's a completely different, completely different concept. Stop talking, stop talking, stop talking. Woof. Hello, Ron Burrell. Uh, you want to learn maths? Where really to start? Um, depends what you already know. If you know... Depends what you already know, really. If you don't know any calculus, so if you don't know about um, differentiation or integration or polynomials, then you're looking at something like A-level maths or equivalent. Um, A-level maths is the qualification in the UK where I live. Um, but there are other qualifications around the world, like AP Calculus BC. Um, I'm mentioning those because there's loads of online resources for people who are trying to learn A-level or AP Calculus BC in school or something like that. Um, and there's so many free resources out there that even if you're sneakily not in the classroom for A-level maths or AP Calculus BC, um, you can get their resources and you can see you know, YouTube videos or whatever made for people who are doing AP Calculus BC are also interested. Uh, interesting. Um, if, if that's miles off from you, I think um, things like Khan Academy are really good at uh, getting people uh, to that point and through that point. Um, if you've already done something like A level or equivalent and you want to learn uh, hardcore number theory, uh, then uh, university courses, and lots of them have put their lecture notes online so that you can just look at their lecture notes. Um, some universities are starting to put actually whole stuff on. Uh, whole stuff on. Uh, whole courses on the internet as well. Um, a huge amount of information. Uh, trying to get it in a sensible order is very tricky. Um, uh, neutrino uh, is self-study to count BC. Yeah, wrong rule. It, it really depends what you know. Um, I, I know nothing about you, right? Um, it, it could be the case that you need to hit hints on um, quadratic equations or something if you're uh, if you want to solve quadratic equations, or it could be the case that you when I see the Riemann hypothesis. Um, I'd have 
been I'd have really liked the kind of online resources that we've got now. Um, I'd have really liked those 15 years ago. <laughs> that would have been great. Um, I remember when Wikipedia was quite new and we just thought Wikipedia was a joke. Um, uh, we thought it was weird that Wikipedia had articles on loads of different things and now it's actually quite good for a first look at the, the top of a Wikipedia article if you're trying to get scripts with what a maths topic is. Uh, if you just want to see cool maths, then um, I quite like Quantum Magazine. I think I'm going to plug it. I think I am going to plug it. This is daft. Why am I plugging a magazine? Everyone's going to think it's like sponsored content. Oh, I just love it. <laughs> okay, not sponsored. But um, um, if you want an impression of what modern mathematics is like, um, I really do like the articles on Quantum Magazine. Um, I just think they're neat. Cool. Okay. Uh, two seconds. Sorry. Now it feels like an ad break because I gave you something that resembles an ad, and I took a quick break. Oh yeah, thank you, Neutrino. Uh, Neutrino's reminder is just to hydrate. That applies to you as well. Ah. Um, if you've been looking at the screen for half an hour, remember to look at something else. Um, <laughs> if you haven't drunk any water today, drink some water. Uh, good. Let's learn about the totient function. What are we learning about the totient function? It's not this. It's this. You're going to multiply by p minus 1, it's the, it's the ones that are not multiples of prime that you want. Not 1 in p, but almost all of them. So I should check this out on a number like 9? Yeah, what's 5, 9? So 5, 9 is the thing's co-prime to 9. He immediately writes down 3, <laughs> 2, 4, 5. You see, it's things. I've got to skip the multiples of 3. I just have 6 things. My formula says... I should do 3 times 2. Ah, oh, 3 times 2 really is 6. Okay, phew, getting there. This multiplied by that. Okay, good. Never know when I might need that. Right, lecture 3, let's go. <laughs> Are we going to do 5 of these? I mean, maybe. Let's find out. Uh, simultaneous congruences. Oh, we're going to do Chinese Romero theorem. Brilliant, do like it. Um, in one, these things are incompatible because this is two more than multiple of five and this is three more than multiple of five. These things are not co-prime. But in two, these things are co-prime. Suppose we have x10 and x13 such that x10 is one zero. Ooh, okay. I've never seen it like this. x10 and x13 such that x10 is one mod 10 and x10 is 0 mod 13. I keep trying to undo on the wrong device. x10 and x13 is 1 mod 13 and 0 mod 10. I'm actually going to write these the other way around. Because now it looks like a, now it looks like a matrix. Um, we can make, in fact, make any point by a suitable linear combination because right if you want something to be 7 mod 10, you can just take this thing multiply by 7. And if you want something to be 3 mod 13, you can take this thing and multiply by 3 and then add them and the zeros behave nicely. That's really it. Um, here is, what is this? I'm not quite sure what this diagram's doing. Is x10 supposed to be a point on this or is this the variable? Oh, I don't know. Seven of those. Yeah, it's kind of a point here. And three of those. Got the axes and more ten and more thirty. Okay, okay. Um, feels like this should loop a bit more, right? <laughs> There's a donut, right? It's always a donut. Um, can we find such x ten and x thirteen? There exist h and k such that these things we can actually find h and k using Euclid's algorithm and re then reversing it. What are we going to do with this? So H is an example. Oh, uh, maybe we need we need inverses. Mod ten and mod thirteen. No. 
Okay, here we go. Chinese remainder theorem. The zoo gives us these. Right, here we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, oh, they're laid out in my way around now. M1, M2 with M1001. Let X1 be M2K. Um, oh, this is a bit clever for me. Oh, which is one more than a multiple of H. And X2 be M1 H. Okay. Then N, just multiply those. Oh, okay, okay. So we're looking for something that is a multiple of 10 and is one more than a multiple of 13. And that's what 10H did. So back down here. Sorry, I got left a little bit because um, from here it was supposed to be obvious to me what was going to happen next, but I wasn't really following it. Um, I should have spent more time staring to say, aha, this underlined thing, X13, this underlined thing is a multiple of 10 and it is one more than a multiple of 13. And this underlined thing is a multiple of 13 and it's one more than a multiple of 10. That's exactly what we need, do the combination. Bazoo it up. This is great. Um, the matrix here is very suspicious. Um, I don't want to go there right now, but I should probably come back to this at some point. Um, so then you'll just get, then it just works. Multiply, multiply up and you're done. Um, do some linear combination like that. Good. Okay. So you can solve these congruences. And if you have three of them or four, then that's fine. If they're mutually go primary, just keep building them. Yep. Okay. There you go. <laughs> um, keep going. Pairwise co prime. May or may not be. And here's the algebra. Good. Right. So the map that goes like this is an isomorphism of rings. And more generally, in the structure here, so you can split down z mod nz into these things. The sort of separate primes behave separately in your mod n world. So this is like z mod 10z, which is a, a world we use quite a lot, last digit of your number. This is saying that it's z mod 2z times or cross z mod 5z. The other your multiples of two oddness and evenness. Um, and separately you have your remainder mod 5. And if you keep track of each of those, is your number even or odd? And is it a multiple of, um, it, what is it remain, What is its remainder when you divide by 5? If you keep track of both of those, you can reconstruct what it is mod 10. Um, and the arithmetic of last digit carries over nicely that separately the evenness and oddness does its own thing, right? Isomorphism of rings because these things, yeah, you can add a multiply. Okay, good. Work, modulate powers of primes, and then piece together information. It's a good slogan. <laughs> it's a good slogan. Slogan is a very Vicky Neal category um, of thing to put in lecture notes. Um, the slogans help you understand help you understand what we've what we're doing and what we've done. What's going on here? Let m1, m2 be as above, and a1 and a2 be integers that are co-prime. There is a solution to this. Isn't that exactly what we were doing? What's the difference? What's the difference? These things are supposed to be... Oh, this is about... This is in particular for co-prime things. Oh, the inverse of, no. I don't know what this is saying. There's a proof here. Theorem nine, which was CRT, says that there is a solution Suppose that the, I was going to say, it's this bit, is it? That the solution is co-prime to M1, M2. Um, so if not, then there's a prime which divides N and which divides that, so it divides one of them, let's say it's M1. Um, we have A1 mod 
M1, so P divides A1, but no, we said they were co-prime. Okay, more algebraically, oh, right, okay, this is a bit better. So the units, right, okay, the group of units in that group, so up here we had this group. Not a group, <laughs> not a group, <laughs> it's ideal. Um, and down here we've got an ideal because now we're looking at the, down here we've got a group because now we're looking at things that have got inverses and that splits out nicely as well. Yeah, the representations, representations are all right. More generally, same thing happens. F is totally multiplicative if it works like that for all M and N. Um, the Euler function is multiplicative. Phi is not totally mo multiplicative. Because 5, 4 is 2. 5, 2, 5, 2 is 1. So it's not true for all M and N, but it is it, when M and N have a co-prime. Pretty sure I've seen this. Ah! <laughs> ah! We got there. <laughs> Thanks, thrice right. Th thank you, thrice shy in chat for correcting me. Otherwise, this would have come as a bit of a shock. Um, it's the ones that ones that are not prime that I wanted. Ah. <laughs> Precisely p minus one over p of them. Okay. Um, look at me. No, no. Now that I've, now that I've been told the correct answer, I'm now saying the correct answer multiple times to try and reinforce it. <laughs> Is this toxic behaviour? I'm not sure. Um, okay. What's going on here? Oh, right, it's the proof. The proof's the, the number of things that go prime, and it just splits across the group. That is nice. Chinese remainder theorem. Corollary means that it follows from the previous thing. Good. Okay. Uh, and it works like that because. Well, these things are not co prime. And then. Yeah, you've got to count them. Discard the multiples of p. They're at p to the k minus one, the number I wrote down of them. Good. I'm going to be interested in the sum of these things. Okay. That's my toxic behavior was taking something that somebody said in chat and saying it myself lots <laughs> to try and cover for the, the thing that I said was wrong. <laughs> um, they, um, if I said enough, people might forget that I was wrong the first time. <laughs> Not really. Okay. What's this doing? Why are we adding up? For, I don't know why we're adding these things together. I'm not sure I've seen this before. It's just learning, right? <laughs> we're learning. <laughs> okay, what am I learning? I'm learning that Vicky says we're going to be interested in adding up the number of things that the prime to D adding those up for all D that are factors of some number N. It's like taking the numbers that are factors of 12 and adding up how many things are co-prime to each of those, which, what? It's equal to N. <laughs> this is brilliant, I've never seen this before. Chat, have you seen this fact before? You add up five of the devices, add up five of the devices and you get your number back. This has got the same um, beats as one of those magic tricks. This is great. Why have I never seen this before? If I have one, two, oh, the sum of, this is like the thing about the sum of the factors factorizing, I think. Look at separate primes. What was the slogan? Look at separate, separate primes. One, two, three, four is two squared. So you get the ones with two squared in. The separate primes split, just like they do when we're doing the sum of factors, except there's loads of phi's in there. But the phi's being, Multiplicative means you can sp split those things out. Because you can do this for any function that. Mm, the definition above, you can do this for any function that splits on prime. So the thing we're doing here quite a lot is that. The thing we're doing here quite a lot is that phi of AB is phi of A, phi of B for co prime A and B. We're doing that quite a lot because now we're going to combine them back together again and then add them. Uh, okay, so in this step, we're using what phi actually is. These are the prime powers, four and three, that make up 12. Every number's made of prime powers, really. 
if you count three as a prime power uh, and four. <laughs> three numbers made of prime powers? What am I saying? Three or four are prime powers. Six is made of prime powers because it's two times three. Separate, separate primes. Um, right, why is 5D? What's going on here? So somehow this is going to be for a prime power. So I imagine our proof is going to go for a prime power. Okay. And that one over there. So here's the proof. Uh, it's not done yet. But the proof first is to say that it's multiplicative. Itself, the big thing, is multiplicative. Because if you've got D1 and D2, uh, whoa, the, what are these divisors? D1 divides M, D2 divides N over their co-prime numbers. They don't have any divisors in common. And then that's going to split up like this using other way that each of these things splits as 5d1, 5d2, because phi does that. What was corollary 11? Euler function is multiplicative, good. Feels like we've got some serious content and it's also silly, or just brilliant, I don't know, I, I, I sort of find this funny. f of m, f of n, fine, okay. So f is multiplicative. Okay. What is this going to be? f of a prime power? f of a prime power and then we're done? It's going to be f of a prime power and then we're done, isn't it? It's going to be look at a prime power. The divisors of your prime power are smaller prime powers. Induction. Induction. Um, Phi of those involves, we know what that is, it's p to the k minus 1, p minus 1. So it'll be a geometric series that then sums up. So induction, geometric series, gives you back that prime power at the end. Let's have a look at it. Yeah, it's got j's and i's in it, but here we go. Um, p to the prime, and f of p of g, prime powers. <laughs> sometimes, I have to, sometimes I have to look like I'm trying, right? It's not enough to just put some content on the board and read it out. I've got to try and say what's coming up next. Prime power, let's go. Um, so it's summing, oh, what's this? Oh, it's just even better. The difference, like Thrice I wrote it in chat, the difference between these things, um, difference between these things, which is then going to telescope. Beautiful. That's really nice. <laughs> and there's a one plus from the five of one. One is my favorite divisor. Um, and those add up and telescopes give you five PJ back. So then you're done. If it works with prime powers and it's multiplicative, all numbers made of prime powers, really. Yeah. Yes, here's the comment that I said out loud as well. That makes me very happy. Um, the proof that f is multiplicative. You could do this for any multiplicative function, small f. Oh, here are some more examples. Yeah, cool person. This is nice, isn't it, by the way? I think I think you're pointing at this sort of section. This is very like I can't draw that kind of cool glasses. Yeah, sunglasses emoji. Um <laughs> it's just it's just neat. It's just neat. When you sum a big thing and it just differences, and okay. Thank you, Marie. Um <laughs> Um, I'm not sure. I think I want a few more attempts at drawing it. <laughs> no, it's getting worse. I'm trying to look in chat. Oh, the ears are supposed to go... If you go further out... Oh, I think it's got worse. Yeah, no, it's much worse. I don't like that at all. Um, welcome back to my drawing stream. Uh, today on the art stream, we're trying to draw sunglasses emoji. Um, let's not... Okay. How are we doing for time? It's three o'clock. And we're about to look at polynomial congruences, um, which I think is going to build up to quadratic residue stuff again. I don't have too many solutions. Oh, this is at most n solutions. Lagrange's theorem. Use a tab proof from ordinary arithmetic. Um, 
done linear. Uh, otherwise, if there are no solutions, we're done because we're saying it's at most. Okay, if it's got a solution, then you can do some factorization. It's fine. Uh, Z mod PZ has no zero divisors. It's a field. So, you know, we're one or the other. Induction hypothesis. Good. Okay. I'm speeding up. Speculation. I've never seen Vicky put a section of speculation. Brill. Um, yep. They're a group of units. Orders of elements. They divide P minus 1 because of Fermat's little theorem. Fermat lattice tomato. Can we say more? Hmm, the number of elements of each order. I feel like this is the sort of thing that I've seen. Possibly I saw it two weeks ago. Um, maybe not. Uh, there's some patterns there. Do we always have elements of order P minus one? Are there always 5D elements of order D? Oh, that's an impressive guess. Oh, that would be nice, wouldn't it? Because phi of d, we know those things sum up to d, so there'd be enough of them. Or sum up to n. The, the, the phi of your divisor sums up to n, because it works with prime powers. So, yeah, that'd be very nice, wouldn't it? Hmm. The aim is to show there is an element of order p minus 1. Idea show that there are five d of order, <laughs> elements of order d. A much stronger thing, which has for each d dividing p minus 1. The size of the group. n here is p minus 1. That's kind of cool. p minus 1 could have... Ah, oh, hear me out. p minus 1 could have a lot of factors. It could have not so many. So some primes are one more than something really cool, like 37 is one more than 36, loads of factors there. Um, but some primes are one more than a quite boring number. Is that, am I allowed to say that? Like 11 is one more than 10? It's not a very exciting composite number. So twos and fives, isn't it? Okay, 5D elements for the... I'm having so much fun that I think I'm just gonna smash through and we'll see if we can look at a question sheet in a bit. Some primes are one more than even number. Yeah, Pwah, rubbish. <laughs> Some primes are one more than a multiple of six. Ugh, who would be one more than a multiple of six? Uh, rubbish. Uh, okay, okay. Stop dunking on primes. Am I going to read this? I think I'm going to read this. I'm going to be strong and I'm going to read this proof. Uh, and then maybe do something different. Maybe this is the breaking point for my understanding of number theory this afternoon. <laughs> Did a dramatic look to the camera, but missed. <laughs> my breaking point for primes this afternoon. There we go. Stop messing around and read the proof. Um, all right, if then the size of SD, SD is the uh. The set of things where A has order D. Hello, Mash Raccoon. Um, this is very much not GCSE, sorry. Uh, if you want a hand with GCSE, you could put a question in chat and see if people will help you if you want to do some GCSE maths. I'm trying to learn number theory, which maybe should be on GCSE. I should stop messing around and read the proof. Uh, we're trying to prove this. Uh, what we're we trying to prove? Let me scroll a tiny bit. We're trying to prove that the group of units modulo P is a cyclic group that you can generate it with a single generator. Sorry much, Raccoon. Uh, I do feel for you. I reckon you've possibly typed maths into Twitch and this is what's come up. Yeah, greatest common divisor is in, um, it's common factors and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Everybody be, everybody be nice. Look, if Much Recruit puts a GCSE question in chat, we're going to be lovely. <laughs> we're, the, we're the nicest. We're the nicest math stream on Twitch right now, in the just chatting category with this color scheme. Um, okay, okay. Um, oh, that's Much Recruit. There you go. 
There you go, you've got a conic sections question. Okay, chat, there you go. <laughs> um, chat's gonna help you out. Chat's gonna help you find the loci of conic sections, which for an ellipse would be, this point kind of, kind of like the middle, and for a parabola would be that point over there, which is something to do with the curvature of the parabola. For a hyperbola, I don't really know where the foci are. I can't remember what they can't remember what that means. Okay. Yeah, much raccoon, you yeah, you've slammed down chat here. It's brilliant to see. Um A comic section would be uh, part of the live stream where I'm trying to do a joke instead of reading a proof. Uh, a conic section is the one that you you want there. Okay, let's let's actually go. Um, so let's partition this. Uh, everything's in here for different values of d because it's got to have some order. Um, so the sum over these things of the sine of s d is p minus one. Is this thing going to be multiplicative? That would be nice. We were just doing some adding over divisors, looking at multiplicative flows. It's going to turn out to be 5D, which is a multiplicative function. Maybe that's where we're going. Um, suppose that SD is not empty, so S is in SD. There is something with all of D. Then these things are distinct elements because we haven't got D yet. And they are solutions of, ah, polynomials, let's go. Now these things, X to the D minus one, is equivalent to zero mod p. Why do they solve this? Because then we'd have a to the k d, which is a to the d to the k. Um, most d solutions, and we've got all of them. So s d is contained in. Oh, it's contained in these. Oh, we don't know that these. Actually, we don't know that these have order d. We just know they satisfy this. Um, their orders divide D, I guess. Um, we want to know which of the elements have order D. Suppose AJ has order D, then K divides D. Right, because in a subgroup of order D, so the order of this element within that subgroup divides D. Also, A to the JK. <laughs> Is one because it's got order k, but a has order d, so d divides j k. <laughs> if j is going from to d, right, we're getting there. If j is going from to d, then d divides k. Was d? Was, was d? Was d? Now it makes me suspicious. Oh, all the primes in d divide the other side. So this is true, not just for this sort of step is sort of inference is true. Um, this sort of inference is true, not just for prime numbers. Made me nervous though. Uh, K also divides D, so K equals D. Why did K divide D? Oh, it starts up here. Um, good, okay, I feel, feel like, always feels like going around in a circle, but um, we've used all the available information, I think. So A to the J really does have order D. E of J is co-prime to D. Is it the case that if A to the J has order D, then J can D? The highest common factor is one. And that would be nice because then we'd know precisely which ones of these were um, precisely which ones of these were in SD. It's going to end up being the case, isn't it? Because we're looking for ones out of these D which J are co prime. And that's going to be how many there are. If J is M being one, then uh, if they're not co prime, then you could do some division. Okay, here we go. Um, D over M is an integer. This is A to the D. J over M is an integer. And A to the D is 1 mod P. So A to the J has order D over M, less than D. Oh, okay. So the ones that actually have order D is the set A to the J. Like A is just, if we just took one of them that, that worked, one of them that worked, and then took powers of it, and we worked out those powers have to be co prime to D. So this is exactly that's and that's all of them because 
any more of them would also satisfy this equation. We already had enough things that satisfy that equation. That's pretty cute. So the size is 5D, so then we get it's either 0 or, or 5D. Um, 0 if there isn't anything, or 5D if there is. Little wrinkle there. Um, the sum of these things. Oh, okay, okay. And so then the thing about the sum, you, you don't want any of these to be 0 because yeah, you don't want any of these things to be zero. In fact, how am I going to prove? What are we doing here? I think you don't want any of these things to be zero, unless you're missing out on some potential summing. Where I, I'm thinking of it being you want the sum of SD to be equal to over all the divisors, you want that to be n, I think. Yeah, so n is p minus one or whatever it, whatever it is. Um, so you also need the sum of, yes, we want, and we know, that the sum of 5d for d dividing n is equal to n by that beautiful bit of maths about a page and a half ago. Um, even if, da, 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 da. So in fact, this is equal to it for all devices. For all devices, d of p minus 1. Um, and so is it here for all the others? Oh, yeah, yeah, because you can't. Your order has to divide the order of the group. That's Lagrange's theorem. Good, okay. Uh, chat has been fooled. <laughs> I didn't, I missed before that it was much raccoon saying chat has been fooled. <laughs> We've been had. <laughs> you, you truly know good effort, good effort to in, engage and Finally, a good way to find the loci of the colleague section. I think it's just a formula, right? Which is a bit of a disappointing thing to say. It's kind of if you if you know what if you're given an ellipse, if you're given an ellipse and you don't know where the foci are, well, what have you been told about the ellipse? Maybe you've been told it's semi and it's semi major and semi minor axes. In which case, there's a formula for the distance between the loci distance between the foci in terms of the eccentricity, which I can't remember, but it's not that hard. So, I mean, oh well. Yeah, um, I can't really remember what foci are for a conic section like this. Maybe, I just don't know how it works for, for these. Which is a cheap way of me saying I don't know what the definition is, so I don't have a way of solving for it. It's definitely a calculation you could do for the parabola. Uh, it's very sort of Isaac Newton sort of calculation to say this thing about the foci being the point where if you shine light into a parabola, into a parabola, and let it bounce off, off the, of the. I guess bounce as if it's a flat mirror at each point using the tangent, then all those rays of light coming in from here, all those rays of light bounce and end up on the same spot. The focus, well, the focusing effect of the parabola, it's a very good fact. Uh, when I was in school, I had a go at proving it just, you know, it's just a really obvious way, right? You've got these vertical lines, you've got a parabola, okay, let's go. Um, you've got the parabola of y equals x squared, right? I know the tangents to y equals x squared, so you show me, a uh, beam of light coming in vertically at x equals c or something, and then work out where well, I know the gradient there. Gradient is 2c, so then you've got to work out the bounce. Um, and you know where this point is, and you know something about angles. It's not that impossible to work out where that line's going, and then you check they all go through some point. And I don't think I completed it when I was in school, but it feels like this sort of thing. It feels like this sort of thing people could do. <laughs> sort of thing Isaac Newton would have enjoyed, I think. Um, okay. Uh, until now, our names for the elements, I have 1 up to p minus 1, were good for addition but less so for multiplication. We can now view elements as 1 up to a to the p minus 2, because a to the p minus 1 would be, yeah, okay, which is better for multiplication. Good. Okay. 
We've done four ledges. Four ledges is one sixth of them, which is not really enough to look at the sheet yet. So I think I'm going to bash on. Bash on. Okay, okay. It's this sort of comment that I like. This can happen. <laughs> it's just and bad. Good. <laughs> this is why you read Vicky Vicky Neal lecture notes. Um, okay. Um, if A is a generator, oh, are they not all generators? Oh, you got me feeling like they were all generators. Why would they not be generators? Oh, not all of them have ordered D minus one. Only, only five P minus one of them are generators for the group. How do we find them? Ah, right. SD is not generators. SD is the ones that have order D. If you particularly want the ones with order S P minus one, then you only get four of them, which is five, 12. Is five, 12 really four? One, three, three, four, five, six, seven, 11. Yep, good, okay. You only get four things that generate that group. Okay, cool. I feel like I've learned more about cyclic groups than I was expecting to today. So that's nice. Um, hmm. Yeah, so these are weird groups. This is not quite like, it's not me learning about cyclic groups, which I know have generators. Um, these groups are cyclic and with a slightly weird number of elements. It does weird me out a little bit that P is prime. This thing has P minus one elements. And P minus one is not prime. Having P elements is nice in your group because it means it's cyclic with order P. Having P minus one elements, oh, it could be loads of things, could be weird stuff going on. Um, right, being cyclic is very good because then, yeah, you get these, this way to write all of the elements down here for some but not all A. Eh? There's actually five P minus one of choices. Five P minus one. Well, we don't know how to factorize P minus one, so I don't think I can say very much about that. <sighs> can I say anything about five P minus one? I can't think of anything. Okay. Um, we're now going to study Z mod P to the J Z. I sort of hope that a lot of it carries over. Try z p squared, there's order p p minus one. Doesn't feel cyclic, but it feels like the p squared stuff's gonna z more p squared has got elements up to p, and then you skip one. I am learning, and then you do you have some elements and you skip one. I feel like those are in separate batches. Uh, which I suppose maybe it would track separately. Um, something like some coarse metric of how big, which which of these are they cosets? Which of these cosets you're in, and then something fine grain for which of the elements you are, like this cross of two things. I guess it could still be cyclic, and I think it, I think we're about to prove that it is probably. Um, here we go. We know there's a primitive root modulo P. A primitive root is something that generates that group. Then these are all different, so they're all different modulo P squared. But what is the order of A modulo P squared? So if I make you wait until you get around mod 37 squared, how many power do you have to take A to? Is it as much as this? Say A has order D by Lagrange or Fermi. D divides that. So if you do it this much, then okay, you get around. Also, A to D is one more P squared. So A to D is one more P. But A has order P minus one modulo P. Ah, because it's primitive root generates this one. So P minus one divides D, and we said that D divides P P minus one. So either D equals P minus one. Uh, or 
Um, or is P, P minus 1. I like Tan May Cat 77. The limit does not exist! <laughs> Who's watching Mean Girls? Um, I haven't seen the musical remake, musical Mean Girls version. Um, the version that went to become a musical and then come back again. Um, and I don't know if they still have the maths competition in, but uh, thanks for reminding me about that film. Um, okay, we've got a bad case and a good case. If D is equal to P minus 1, we're considering that bad. Oh, because it won't generate the whole group. Uh, um, and uh, if it's good, if it is equal to P minus 1. Why are those the only two cases? So D contains kind of all the factors of P minus 1. It's at least as big as P minus 1. And then you have a choice, I suppose. You either have this factor of P in or you don't. Um, uh, Mario, I haven't seen I haven't seen the new one, but yeah, it does not exist in mode. <laughs> I, I love the original movie very dearly. Um, I wish I'd seen it when I was. I wish I'd seen it earlier. Um, um, I think seeing a maths team on film would have been really useful for me growing up. <laughs> I saw it at uni. Um, uh, okay. Um, we want this to be not one, not p squared. Oh, okay, we want this. <laughs> well, that's the order D. We want that to be not that. Ah, uh, pop test three minus i. We've got to do it in R cos cos theta plus i sine theta notation. Ah, okay, pop test, pop test. Three, I'm doing it, I'm doing it. Re m over here. So we're going to do it as root. Nine plus one is ten. We're going to do this angle here. Theta is arc tan of 1 over 3. It's the angle behind a duck, isn't it? Where's is that arc sign? Um, R is root 10. Cos theta plus I sine theta. Did it. I get a follow. I did get a follow. Thanks for the follow. Um, <laughs> and I've done your homework. <laughs> it's all happening today. We've got a request for GCSE maths that turned into conic sections. And then we go, we're getting our complex numbers out as well. Good. Right, so we'd quite like an element that actually generates z, z mod p squared um, and isn't just generating uh, it's generating p minus one different elements. I want to generate the whole thing if this thing really is going to be cyclic. I again have a feeling uh, that we're we're um, I have a feeling we're going to prove it's cyclic. Yeah, I is square root minus one root. Yeah, that's what I did. Okay, so this axis is marked one, but it's the imaginary direction. Ooh, spooky. Um, I should probably have done minus one third. Whoops. <laughs> probably in hindsight, that should be marked minus one, shouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe my arc tan is really spooky and weird as well. Um, okay. Minus signs. You can never have enough. You can <laughs> wait. Hang on. Let's workshop this joke. Um, it's going to have to be. It's going to be along the lines of like minus signs. You can't have enough of them. And also, it's going to be both, right? It's going to. It's sort of kind of capture the idea that you might have too many or not enough. Uh, I'm not doing another one. Um, square root and square both those things. That's your. That's your R. Arctan the numbers in your question. That's. That's the that's the theta. Um, okay, it's workshop joke though. Um, serious business workshopping the workshopping the joke. Minus signs, you can't have too many of them. You can't have too few of them. Nah, that's weak. That's weak. I've got to want to catch that capture that kind of binary of like you've either got one too many or one too few. Um, we'll get there. We'll get there. Okay.
minor signs, one too many, one too few, uh, something like that. It's more of a slogan, more of an advertising slogan for the concept of too many minor signs. Um, okay, where are we getting this? Let's try and look ahead a bit. Lemma 16. There is a primitive root. Uh, <laughs> turn it over, turn it over again, yes. Turn it over, turn it over again. Uh, ten my cats says I look like Peter Piker, Parker from Spider-Man, and then I have to ask which one, and I know which one. I know which one of the Spider-Man I look like. We, we're all thinking it. It's not one of the cool ones. Um, spoilers for a movie. Um, I, I saw a movie with the, the one Spider-Man in. Uh, um, and that's, that was very good. Uh, I liked that a lot. Um, It's not Andrew Garfield, is it? Nobody ever thinks I look like Andrew Garfield. And it's also not Tom Holland. Um, right, okay. <laughs> uh, what are we doing? What's Lemma 16? Uh, there is a primitive root, say G, such that this thing, this. What are we doing? What are we doing? Lemma 17. I'm going to skim. P and prime root, B and T. J V a natural number. Um, oh my goodness, stacks of powers. What is this? Uh, G such that G to this. It's not one. Uh, is Toby Maguire not a nice person? Yeah, we're doing too many things at once, you should know. I'm trying to work out what we're doing. I thought I thought we were trying to prove something cyclic, but we're just getting lemmas and lemmas. Um, Jake was one is exactly lemma sixteen, so I was sort of skipping ahead to see what this where this is going. Hey, yeah, it's going where I thought it's going. Things cyclic, yo. Um, tell me, cat. I graduated from Cambridge. I did eight years at Cambridge. Got three degrees. Decided that was enough degrees. Um, for eight years, also enough time. Um, so I work at a different university. I work at Oxford. Um, I teach people at Oxford, and in my spare time. I'm trying to learn other courses that I'm not teaching. That's me. Um, okay, we should fact check whether or not Toby Maguire is a nice guy. I could believe either ways. Reality often disappointing. This is not a slander. This is me saying we should we should check. Um, Peter Parker not a nice guy. Oh, okay. Also Spider Man, right? Okay, a few. Right, good. Um, Okay, so this is going where I thought it was going. We're trying to prove that this thing is cyclic. I'm not sure I've quite got the patience right now for one and a half pages of the proof. <sighs> because, yeah, there's a lot of steps. We've done well to get this far, I think. But down here. It's not true for primes P equals 2. I knew there was something odd about this prime. Um, this thing is not cyclic. No element has order four. Oh, this is cool. Okay. Exercises. What is the structure of these? What is the structure of these groups? Which n is this? Wait, what? Oh, when can you put them together? Uh, okay, so it's got no. So you've got to build it out of cyclic ones. Um... And which is a primitive root mod p squared. Must be a primitive root mod p. Um, my feeling is that the twos will come in. No, the, the fact that two sometimes there aren't primitive roots. Okay, good exercises like it. So it's getting to a point. Yeah, okay. And then down here. Okay. Three is primitive root. Mod seven, it has all the six. So three to the six is one more than one full of seven. And 104 is co prime to seven. So three to six is one more seven squared. Ah, oh, you're asking me those problems. Ah, oh, the complex number questions is a, oh, it was a joke. Chat, it fell for a joke. 
this is such a serious live stream. It's like, oh no. We lost so much time on having fun. <laughs> you gotta get back gotta get back on this. Um Why is this trying to tell me? You can keep going, right? This source says we keep going. Three to six is not one mod seven squared. Oh, so it's not one not one mod seven cubed or seven to the four either, because restricts down. So three is a primitive root mod seven to the n for all n equal to one. Ooh, okay. So it came down to the fact that this quotient in here is not a multiple of seven. It's not not there's no sort of seven squared secretly hiding in here. This thing doesn't collapse down to being one. Oh, it was one already. Seven squared. At the seven squared point. Uh, hmm. Yeah, quadratic residue spotted. Um, more stuff going on. Um, yeah, that's, that's my mistake, isn't it? That's my mistake. Putting it on the internet. What was I thinking? <laughs> okay, that's five lectures. Um... Five lectures of stuff. Skipping most of lecture five, if I'm honest. That proof that it's cyclic. As advertised, I think I would like to look at the question sheet because we haven't been brave enough to do that before. So I think maybe this is useful. Uh, maybe it's useful. And whoa, quickly looking at the the end of end of the lecture notes. Um, my memory of Cambridge question sheets is some of it's fine, some of it's interesting, and some of it's impossible. So let's go. Lecture's supposed to be one hour, 50 minutes maybe, if you allow for five minutes. Start five fast, end five minutes too, 50 minutes. So trying to do five of them. I mean, lecture one hardly counts because we've seen natural numbers before and bazoo, but trying to read through four of them in one hour was probably a stupid idea. Um, hour and a half. We're speed problem things here, even though it's such chill, we're, we're speedy. Um, do we understand it? Not at all. Uh, let's find out. Okay, so what do I think of this example sheet from 2011? So I think there's statutes of limitations on me talking about this example sheet. Uh, if you're a student from 2011 and you've got hold of this and you're trying to get the answers, no, bad. Go and, go and do your 2011 work. Um, Get out of the time machine. Stop inventing time machines. Don't do your work. <laughs> cool, right, I'm going to talk about the answers. Um, okay, so this is running Euclid's algorithm. So this is the favourite sort of like, just go and check you can run Euclid's algorithm. Lovely. Do I think anything weird's going to happen? I think the first one they will turn out to be co prime, the second one they're weirdly not a co prime. Uh, can I be bothered to work out what the highest common factor is? Like, you actually have to go and work out the highest common factor. Oh, why have I started writing this? This was a huge error. Just complete unforced, unforced error, because now I'm going to have to do less of multiplication. Um, oh, do I think they're both secretly multiples of seven or something weird like that? No, maybe, no. Um... Um, maybe they're co-prime, you know, maybe they're co-prime. So can I, multiply, can I multiply this by 5? 2, 2, uh, multiply by 4. 4, 4, 2 times 4, 8, 16, 17, 68, 2, 1, 7, 1, take away 17, 68, uh, 3, 0, oh, 1, 1, 4. So then I've got 4, 4, 2 and 4, 0, oh, 3. So difference 41, and these things are, no, uh, difference 39, oh, my favourite number. And these things are not multiples of 3, are they secretly multiples of 13? Oh, come on, let's just check if they're multiples of 13, right? I'm going to cheat. <laughs> Welcome to cheat mode, where we take numbers like this. Yeah, hang on, this is a multiple of 13. That's definitely... And that one is as well, isn't it? Cool, they got highest factor, can't factor 13. 
Oh, yeah, sorry. Favourite number 37. Uh, 39, I'd say it's my favourite number sarcastically because it causes me so many problems. Um, because I think it's prime. Uh, 37 is like angel. 39 is like the, the devil that has been sent to uh, ruin my life. Good, right. Yeah, it's important to have like strong and insane opinions about numbers. Uh, that's how you do it. That's a healthy approach to a number theory course. Uh, what are we doing? Um, uh, yeah, I've seen this sort of calculation before, the number of individual applications. So how long does it take to run a Euclid's algorithm? And it can go very slowly if the quotients, the quotient's always one, then it's very slow. Uh, and if it's, it can go very fast if the numbers are equal or one's a multiple of the other. Uh, yeah, I've got to vote for pi in chat. Uh, 38. Yeah, that means, yeah, it's us. Now let's do theology instead, right? Um, <laughs> humans. <laughs> I may have read Good Omens recently. Um, would recommend. Uh, good, okay. Shades of Grey. Uh, yep, okay, examples of this. A, B, and C are fixed natural numbers. We are just introduced solutions. Integer solutions. Where possible, give an example of such an equation that has no solutions. 2x plus y equals. Oh, but those are co-prime, so the only thing I write is going to have solutions. 2x plus 4y equals 3. Haha, <laughs> try solving that. Um, exactly one solution. Wait. Is that impossible? That's impossible. Infinitely no solutions. Yeah, get okay. 2x plus y equals 3. You can always do this kind of increase decrease malarkey where you go x up by x increase by 1 and y decrease by minus by 2. And that will increase the left hand side by 2, take away 2. Oops, you will get 3 again. So you can keep going. Can I think of any solutions to this? I should be able to think of solutions to this, right? Yeah, x equals 1, y equals 1, and then you can go up by 1, right? You can go up by 1, so long as you go down by 2 on this one. 4 take away 1 is 3. Welcome to chill maths. 4 take away 1 is 3. Right, good, okay. Dot, dot, dot. Yeah, like Mean Girls, I can't believe I only found out about Good Omens, re good omens recently. I can't even say it. Um, things I would recommend that I discovered too late. This is a weird list. Uh, the number 37. <laughs> no, this, this is a rubbish list. Okay, good. Um, this says use the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. This is the factorize thing. And it's on the sheet, I think, as a way to check that people have learned what the fundamental theorem of arithmetic is. And also test their understanding by proving this. This is a show that question and a half, isn't it? Um, okay, number of primes. And then... What is going on here? Why is there a 1 plus log x over log 2? That's log base 2x, isn't it? The power of pi x. So there's something to the power of the number of primes. And then, why have we done log base 2 of x? What are we doing? This is like the number of, this is going to be something like the number of things you can make with the available primes. So you have pi of x primes, um, and you can include, include each one. Mm, how many times can you include it? So sort of for each prime, you might have that prime in your number, or you might not. You've got to build all the distinct numbers up to x. Um, I can't see where that log 2 is going to come from yet. Any suggestions in chats about where we're going to get a log 2 from when we're thinking about how to build all of these all of these different numbers up to x? You know, some numbers have got more than one. Oops, no, this isn't true. Um, um, some of these things might be too large. I'm thinking about taking, like, you take some of these primes, you know, threes, you say, and fives of primes. Oh, okay, we'll take a few of each of those. Um, log 2. The primes are all bigger than or equal to 2. I 
think it's something like this. And then this power really makes me think. Um, oh, two's the smallest prime. How many twos have you got? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we've got lots of brackets. Up to x, you might have threes or three squares or three cubes or three to the four. There could be all these interesting possibilities. How many possibilities were there just now? Well, quite a few because you get up to three to the four. But at most, um, at most, uh, as far as you get with twos. Um, okay, so how far can you get with twos? So uh, you could go one plus two plus four plus. These are all powers of two that you might see in your factorization. Two to the n, where two to the n is less than x. Uh, so you get brackets like this. Where am I imagining these brackets existing? Um, <laughs> these are possibilities for, yeah, they're not really added. They are 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, up to 2 to the n, where 2 to the n is less than x, uh, possibilities for power of 2 in a number up to x. So your number up to x has got some factorization in which might, it might be a factor of 2 or 4 or 8 or 16 or anything up to this 2 to the n less than x. Uh, so I guess n log 2 is less than log x. So this is n is log x over log 2. Uh, and I want, how many of these things do I want? I want n to the 0, 1, 2, 3, I want 1 n plus 1. So there there are n plus 1 possibilities. That is, which is less than 1 plus log x over log 2. Okay, and I've got that for each of my primes. Because for each of my primes, they, each of my primes after that are larger than 2, so they're going to have fewer possibilities. So the number of possibilities is less than this expression. For each bracket, for each prime, um, same for each prime up to x. And the combination of choices gives me the factorization of my number, so I should multiply these possibilities together. It feels like a, a not a very tight inequality because I'm approximating all my primes with two. <laughs> I'm saying, wow, gee, the number's under 50. They might be multiples of 2, 4, 8, 16, 32. Um, and the multiples of three, they might be holds up the same number of fingers. They might be, they might be one, three, nine, twenty-seven, eighty-one, and you say, hang on, some of those numbers you just said were bigger than fifty. Eighty-one's bigger than fifty. You say, wow, yeah, you know, you've got primes like forty-three, you've got a one, forty-three, forty-three squared, forty-three cubed, 40. and this number, which on my fingers is five, um, we're using the same one for all of the, we're using the same number for all of these brackets, um, which feels silly because uh, two is the worst case scenario. You can fit in loads of one, two, four, eight, sixteen. 32, oops, wrong number of fingers. Um, you can fit in loads of vectors of two below 50. Weirdly many. Um, you can't do that for 43 or other primes near the top. But hey, uh, true and feels very true somehow. Uh, and then they want us to manipulate it, which I reckon is going to be a case. This looks okay, like a case of just taking log of both sides, right? Uh, pi x log of 1 plus log x over log 2. I'm not very good at this sort of thing, so going to do my best, I guess. Uh, so it's asking us to rewrite this as 2 log log x. Um, what's going on there? Uh, my handwriting is really bad. We're just there, so I've written on top of it, and now it's much worse. When will I learn that if I've written something badly, I should write it again, rather than writing it on top? Uh, okay, this is exciting though because I think all I need to prove is that uh, when x is bigger than or equal to 8, I think I want that this is less than or equal to pi x log or 2 log log x. Um, that would be nice because then I would divide. Uh, is this definitely positive? <laughs> is that positive? It's positive provided that log x is bigger than 1, which happens when x is bigger than e. So, sure, okay. Uh, is this true, though? So, this would be true if... So, is 1 plus log x over log 2 
less than or equal to log x squared. That looks kind of true, right? This suggests that the number <laughs> number eight is some sort of threshold. This thing grows faster, so at some point this will be true, and then we're good. Yeah, okay, I kind of believe it, but you know, okay. I should I should be more careful and go and check that number eight is special or interesting for this. I mean, it's a quadratic equation, right? Anyway, I can't see a clever reason. Just you know, it's a quadratic. Check when it's true. I don't know the value of log eight. Ah, weird. Okay. Oh, this is good. Wait, so this shows labeling this cool. Because this shows, by the way, that the number of primes below x is large. It's larger than some function, which that's a growing function. This is a proof that there are infinitely many primes. Um hidden in question four of an example sheet. Um and I'm sure the course goes on to do stuff like this, but it's just neat when you get to do it yourself on the example sheet. So this proof there are infinite, infinite, infinitely many primes because the right-hand side grows. It's not the prime number theorem. It's not a good asymptotic. It's not the correct asymptotic for the right answer for how many primes are there below x. Um, but it's better than nothing because it go, that goes to infinity. The limit does not exist. So yeah, it must have infinitely many primes. That is very nice. Okay. What's question five doing? Is it also cool? Let's find out. Uh, prove that if a to the n minus one is prime, a is two and n is prime. Oh my goodness. And you should just put another wow emoji in chat. It's a good question. It's a bit weird having the log log down here, but the log log's not actually in the prime number theorem, but which the prime number theorem says what the pi of x actually, how that actually behaves for large x. Hmm. Okay. Prove that a, if a to the n minus one is prime, and, then a is two and n is prime. Is the converse true? The converse, I think here, would be uh, is two to the p minus one prime if p is prime. And that's a, that's Mersenne primes. So this is moderately cool as questions go. The answer is no, right? Uh, because otherwise Mersenne primes would be really easy to find. Choose your favorite prime number, two to the p minus one, there you go. Uh, so I think the answer is no, just from context of what I know about Mersenne primes. Um, I should prove it by finding some small example. Oh, what's the first one? It's something like two to the 11 minus one is not prime. There's some small counter example. Somebody else can somebody else can take this one in chat. Um, is two to the p minus one prime? Okay. Uh, if n's not prime, if a is n is not prime, then you can do this factorization, which I feel like we did on a maths club live stream on a Thursday recently. Uh, this um, factorizes this yeah neutrino <laughs> same time. N is prime, and what if n is prime but a is not two. Uh, yes, it really feels like the thing we did on the on the live stream. Wait, so three to the p minus one. Oh, that's not prime because that's for p an odd prime. For p an odd prime, that's that also factorizes. Yeah, that factorizes. There's a factor of. 3 minus 1, that's even, so it's not prime. Um, yeah, we've done something like this. Yeah, okay, so it's either got a factor of P minus, either got a factor of A minus 1, excuse me, it's always got a factor of A minus 1, which we need to be 1 for this to be prime, so A needs to be 2, and then if, um, if N's not prime, it's also got a factor of A to the P minus 1, where P divides N. So if N's not prime, then you get extra, more, even more factors. Um, pretty bad. Cool. Okay. Yeah, cool. We have seen things like that before. 
Q's an odd prime. Um, okay, we're doing quite well here. I think with these seven, eight, nine. Um, how do, how do I feel looking looking look, looking at a question sheet? Six looks fun. Seven. Oh, it's if and only if we've tried to do this on chill maths before. Infinitely many primes congruent to three more four. I can't remember. Is three more four the one where? No, it's one mod four where you do a similar argument, right? Yeah. Mm. <laughs> so there's one of these, either this one or this one. One of these you prove by take all of the ones you got, multiply them all together, and then mumble, mumble, add one or something. That's the one mod four version, I think. Let me think. No, it's the three mod four version, right? This is all. This is lots of numbers that are th three mod four. Numbers that form that up to p. There's a version of the multiply them all together and add mumble, add. I think it might be add four, you know? Um, there's a version of that argument where you say, aha, this thing has got um, some prime factors and it must have a prime factor that's three mod four. Not all of its prime factors are one mod four. Otherwise it would be one mod four. Um, so we must be looking for something that's that's absolutely three mod four. But the question says by considering these things, right? Which is like taking all the primes. Oh, okay. This is a different. This pointing us towards a different proof. Um, pointing us towards a different proof. Where I think those are like looking at multiples of up to up to all the primes of p, using the fact that there are infinite infinitely many primes. Um, right. These things don't share any factors, do they? Oh, something. No, they share loads. Ah, <laughs> uh, it's going to be something like that. These things were three. These things are all three mod four. Um, so each of them either is prime or has at least a prime factor that's three mod four. Can't kind of all of its prime factors being one mod four, and then or even. Okay, so maybe all of these are multiples of the devil's advocate. Maybe all of these things are multiples of the same primes that are three mod four. There's a, a few of them that are enough to cover all of these numbers. Um, and so I think you disprove that by saying, aha, uh -huh. any prime that divides if Q divides two squared three five dot dot P minus one, P one minus one, and Q divides two squared three p2 minus 1 then so then something <laughs> something those things are both multiples of q Maybe I should calculate the first few, right? Two squared minus two squared times three minus one is eleven. Two squared times three times five minus one. You get four times three. Well, because twelve times five is sixty, so you get fifty-nine, which is a different prime. So this is quite good pro progress. And then the next one up, you multiply by seven. So instead of getting uh, sixty, you get sixty times seven is five forty, so you get five three nine. And oh gosh, is that multiple of fifty nine? I'm not sure. It's not the case these were all prime, that would be mad. And maybe they have no primes in no prime factors in common. 
It's the minus ones that are throwing me off a little bit here. Yeah, you would divide the difference. You would divide the difference. And the difference goes like this. P1, oh no, the next one. The next ones. Oh, I don't have a notation for this. Up to P2, some more stuff. So is Q just one of those? Rubbish. Okay. What if, yeah, what if Q just is one of these small primes? And, oh, yep, yeah, now it divides all of them. Brill, that's how they came to be 3 mod 4, because they were using one of the six known 3 mod 4 primes. Devil's Advocate again. Oh, five minutes on the clock. Good times. Um, oh, that minus one. I don't like that. I, that includes small primes. Huh. Q is also three mod four. <laughs> what if I only use primes that are one mod four on the way up? <laughs> Wouldn't that be fun? Oh gosh, that would then mean they divide this this weird bracket over here, which I don't really have a good mechanism for interrogating interrogating that. Yeah, I think I want to show they have no factors in common. I still think that's my plan. Switch. Something I liked on the example sheets was being stuck on things, then going to think about something else, and then coming back. Um, oh my goodness. Of course, you end up being stuck on quite a lot of things all at once, but that's, that's what being a mathematician is like. Um, minus one makes it a three mod four and prime. Oh, right. So, yeah, okay. Maybe Neutrino's right. Maybe I can maybe I can come back to this with the idea of the idea of there are only finitely many. But I'm not sure. <laughs> not sure. Okay, up here. Prove that every prime factor of two to the q minus one must be congruent to one mod q. Well that would be nice, wouldn't it? Maybe that'd be good for looking for looking for prime factors of Mersenne numbers. And also congruent to plus or minus one mod eight. Uh, so hang on, what are prime factors? Prime numbers mod eight? It could be plus or minus three mod eight. Those are also possible. Use this to factor two to the eleven minus one is twenty forty seven. Oh, that's nice. Um, I like a practical application. So they'd have the one mod eleven. Oh, and one mod eight, or one mod eleven minus one mod eight. Chinese remainder theorem. Solve those things. The Chinese remainder theorem proof that we did earlier does have a kind of constructive aspect to it. I think you, know, you run, you can just have them your algorithm. You run the zoo. You multiply. You write down the numbers. But it's always very tempting to just take, you know, try and write down solutions. <sighs> one mod eleven minus one mod eight. Um, I would go for forty. No, fifty. Fifty-five. Fifty. Looking for a multiple of 11 and the multiple of 8 that differ by 2. And the Chinese remainder theorem kind of tells you that that's possible. Um, it's a little bit stupid trying to do this. 77 and 80. No, they differ by 3. 66 and 70. Oh, I'm having fun at least. 56. No. If you just joined us, I'm trying to avoid doing Chinese Remainder Theorem by thinking about numbers in my head. It's not very good TV. 22, 23, 23, what 88? Hey, is 2047 a multiple of 23? 
it is because 2047 is 23 from 23 years from now and I happen to know that 2024 is a multiple of 23 because it's current year um, uh, so check 23 and you go and check 23 and 2047 is a multiple of 23 let's do the long division so it's not quite 10 in here it's 9 180 and 27 so I'm going to write 8 for 160 and 24 is 184 and that leaves me 20 which is precisely 9 180 and 27 2047 is 89 times 23 okay cool this is also the answer to question 5 then um, 2 to the 11 minus 1 is not prime ah that's the one I guessed earlier <laughs> Like 10 minutes ago, I had to guess what number to put up there, and I guessed 11, and now we've factorised it. Ah, A plus content. This is why, this is why you came to chill maths. To see someone half remember, half remember a fact, and then later be forced to arrive. Oh, I haven't actually proved those things, have I? I haven't actually done question six. I've just spent ages, ages factorising 2047. What is going on, though? Why don't we have the prime factors of that have to be one more to Q? Well, hang on. Any prime factor would have to be congruent. Prime factor would be one mod Q. It's very hard to talk about. You know, the congruences of the number, the, the Q minus one, don't quite help me think about the congruences of the factors. As a factor that could be multiplied by something else, right? Prime factor must be congruent to one mod q. Maybe just think about mod eight first, I guess. No, that's not helping either. Q is not prime, so this thing, this thing is minus one mod eight. So Q is not prime. So this starts from like three and upwards. So this thing is like uh, a multiple of eight. So this is minus one mod eight. Well, that's not very helpful, right? So my prime factors really could be three. You know, it's not enough information because three. Not enough information because uh, some things are minus one mod eight, like 15. And 15 is 3 times 5. Those things are 3 and minus 3 mod 8. So it's not enough to just say, aha, this is minus 1 mod 8. I've got to do better than that. Plus or minus 1 mod 8. That's very weird. How do I know that... Oh, mm, 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 mm. no, I was going to write down some of the factors of it, right? But that's not possible, <laughs> right? Because then I'd be solving the mass m prime problem. If I just wrote down all the factors, then I'd be like, ah, oh, I could just write out which ones are prime and which ones are not prime. Why can't be not 3 mod 8? So if you have a prime factor that's 3 mod 8, why can't you be a factor of that? Why is that not 15? Um, I don't know. I don't know. Good, okay, okay. Let's look at the rest of the question sheet because I'm running, I'm running out of time on my day. <laughs> Just to find out what else would be what else would be going on. This is uh, four of these for a twenty-four lecture course in Cambridge. This is about two weeks. First two weeks of term. Um, so the students will go to lectures for two weeks, and uh, for each of their courses, get a question sheet like this. Um, haha, they're doing some challenge remainder theorem stuff here. Uh, find all integers. Let's find both this. That looks like fine. Uh, all integers x. You know. Remember to 
Remember to keep adding and subtracting or whatever. There's quite a lot of them. Uh, square three, this looks fun. Um, this looks fun. And then this, prove that the classes of two and three generate that. I, uh, so it's like it's too much for me right now with this P to the J mod P to the J, something that I haven't quite got to terms with yet. We think it's cyclic and that the classes of both two and three generate it. Okay. For all positive integers and oh there was a little example there that gives me hope that we could try and prove this, right? We could work out that um the order of two mod five squared or something um is not too bad. For each of the primes, find a generator of this. Whoa, okay. Find generators, brilliant. Let A be the group of this huge number. Determine the least positive integer n such that g to the n oh, for all g and a. Um, right, so um, separate primes separately. And then some lowest common factor multiple stuff. Um, plus working out whether those things are cyclic or not. And there's some factors of two in there, so be careful. They're not all cyclic. And then the last one, a to the n minus one, order of a plus n z. Okay. Oh, okay. infinitely any primes q such that q is one one n. Last question is always impossibly hard on these question sheets. Um, I agree that q being at least three that convinces me that this thing is minus one mod a. I don't know about its factors though. Why would its factors be congruent to a particular thing? There's loads of possibilities of what you could be mod Q. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> There's something like if P divides 2 to the Q minus 1, then P minus 1 divides Q, or something. Uh, do I mean that? Any, every prime factor is congruent to 1 mod Q. Yeah, yeah. Hmm, the factors. I'm going to have a tiny think about this. P divides that, then P minus 1 divides Q. Yeah. One more than multiple Q. Good. Oh, P minus 1 makes me think about the group. P minus 1 makes me think about the group, right? Hmm. <laughs> yeah, what does Fermat's little theorem tell us? <laughs> Fermat's little theorem tells us that 2 to the p minus 1 is 1 mod p. I don't want mod p or do I want to do this mod q? Fermat's little theorem tells us something interesting. I think I'm getting there, right? Maybe not. P divided to 2 to the q minus 1 means that 2 to the p is 1 mod. 2 to the q is 1 mod p. So 2 to the q is 1 more than a multiple of p. And p minus 1 divided to q. Right, that looks like Fermat's little theorem. Okay, we're getting there. We're getting there. If 2 to the q is 1 more than a multiple of p, then aha, that only happens. Well, not just when q is equal to p minus 1, but then multiples of that. Because that's the order of 2 in the, in the group mod p. Cool, okay, cool. We managed to turn it into a group theory thing. And Fermat's little theorem. It was writing it down and seeing the p minus 1. That was the helpful thing. Okay. Uh, right, so now I want to interpret the other ones in terms of some sort of weird mod 8 kind of nonsense. Ah, mod 8, what is, what is, can we just Fermat's little theorem, Euler it, just to finish off the, finish off the stream? 
Um, uh, it's plus or minus what a what is that? What is that? What is that? So if P divides this, then 2 to the Q is 1 mod P, again, I'm going to try and conclude that P is 1 more than a multiple of 8, is itself 1 more than a multiple of 8, that's pretty weird. Because oh, we sort of know what T to the Q is, right? No, oh, this is not working. Could 2 to the Q be 1 more than a multiple of 3? Yes. <laughs> Could two to the cube be one more than a multiple of three? Yeah, like sixty-four. What if Q is prime? What if Q is prime? So I haven't yet used over here, I haven't used the fact that Q is prime. So over here, maybe I do everything more Q. Maybe I do everything more to Q. It's weird, I've already done. Already written this out as one mod of q for the question, but I haven't yet used the fact that q is prime. Because two to the q really can be one more than a multiple of three, um, but two to the prime q can't because q is odd, so it can't be one more than a multiple of three. Two to the odd isn't one mod three. I'm using 3 as my placeholder for a number that is not plus or minus 1 mod 8. Safe and true. <laughs> yes, it's negative 1. Mod 3. What about 5? It's still two to the odd. Just trying to do some very weird proof by contradiction there also. We look at different cases maybe to disprove the idea that it's factors it could have a factor that's three more than a multiple of eight. There's like one mod three mod eight, which is not a thing people write. One mod three mod eight, Ugh, nasty. Um, huh. Might have to leave this one on pause, I think. Come back, to, come back to this bit. And that question eight has flummoxed me. I think I've got the right attack strategy, but I haven't been able to follow through and get it to the kind of punchline. Ah, maybe I haven't considered this hint enough. A neutrino says something about finitely many primes. Each one of these numbers, each one of these numbers has a factor that's a factor that's three mod four. Um whether or not that's infinitely many primes going into three mod four is annoying. Um, because their factors can have could could have repeats in theory. From looking at the first few, I think maybe they don't. And we've seen Fermat numbers before. They're very similar to these Fermat numbers sort of things, right? 
product of the previous ones. Ah, uh, no, it's not the product of the previous ones. It's times a new prime. Nah, forget that. Okay. Yeah, the Fermat numbers grow at a different rate as well. Yep, and I want to very quickly, because uh, I'm still here, go out fighting. What is this square free question? These are the three questions that I would like to actually think about. Maybe 12, 13, 14. I haven't really engaged. I haven't really engaged with this mod. Z mod. Z mod NZ for N not prime. That's right, the units of Z mod NZ for N not prime. I haven't really engaged with it yet. 174 is square free, but 175 is not. Uh, are they? Yeah, it looks similar, doesn't it? does look similar. Take all of the primes up to your largest one, that's 3 mod 4. Subtract 1. Yeah, take all the ones that, take all the ones, yeah, 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 it's this, isn't it? Take all the ones up to your largest prime, that's 3 mod 4, and throw a couple of 2s in there as well. Take off 1. You've now got something new that's 3 mod 4. Yep, yeah, it's that. It's that. You've now got something new that's 3 mod 4, uh, it is huge, it's bigger, definitely bigger than P because you've multiplied it by at least 6 or something and subtracted 1, so yeah, okay, here's a new number that's got a factor that's 3 mod 4. Sure, it's that. And it's co-prime to um, all of your 3 mod 4 primes. I got a bit thrown by it. this is including things that are not 3 mod 4 as well. For no, no reason, where's 5 here? Where's 5 here? Don't think it needs to be here. <laughs> I mean, this is a kind of a hint, right? I just want to throw in my 3 mod 4 stuff. Yeah, and the subtract one, and this has got to have, because it is 3 mod 4. Yeah, okay, cool. Can't call it considering that done. Yeah, it's a prime, isn't it? But I know, yeah, I so five, five's there because it is a prime, but the punchline in the middle is going to be, the punchline at the end is, aha, this thing has got a factor that is 3 mod 4. So it's got a, it must have a prime factor that's 3 mod 4. And I already included all the primes of factor 3 mod 4 in my product. Um, 5 doesn't need to be there. Nobody, nobody was asking whether or not your number was a multiple of 5. I'm not looking for 5. 5 could, five could not be prime. And <laughs> the argument would still work, I think. You'd multiply them all together. Oops, I missed 5. You subtract 1. You say, well, this is going to be... This is 3 mod 4. Three of these extra two squared as well, I guess. And this is three or four, so um, it must have a prime factor that's three mod four. It can't be the case that all of its prime factors are one mod four. It's odd. It can't be the case that all of its prime factors are one mod four, though. Otherwise, it would be one mod four, and it's three mod four. So it must have a prime factor that's three mod four. And I already used them all. Like five's just here for the right to make the number larger. I don't know. Uncalled for, I think. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not claiming n is prime, I'm just claiming it has a factor. Like the standard proof, you never claim that the, you make this huge number and you don't really claim that it's prime, you just claim that it has a has a factor. Um, and it might not be prime. Um, uh, I'm just not sure 5 is contributing to the logic of the argument. But fine, okay. Um, are there, this is a classic kind of Cambridge question, I love this so much. Are there 100 consecutive numbers that are not square free? Not square free. So each has a repeated prime in its prime factorization. Which doesn't mean it's a square number because there could be other stuff going on like this two squared three five nonsense. Consecutive, so you add one. Um, I reckon it's the answer's probably yes. Um, because you can have like a long string of composite numbers, so why not a long string of these very composite numbers? How am I going to find these? Oh, in the same sort of way, maybe? No. No. Hmm. 
So the thing I'm thinking of is the, the way that n factorial plus n is not prime. For, oh no, sorry, k for n factorial plus k for k equals 2, 3, 4, dot, 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 up to n is not prime. Something like that. Wait, what? <laughs> and not square free. Yeah, any multiple of 9, thrice shy in chat here, any multiple of 9 fails to be square free. Yes. Being square free is a little bit like being prime. I suppose this is good news, right? Yeah, it's a good news. The question's the other way around. Um, <laughs> this is good news. Out of your 100 consecutive numbers, you're guaranteed that some of them will be multiples of 9, and multiples of 9 will uh, are not square free. You'll also have some multiples of 4 in there. And multiples of 25, I guess. What are we doing? Squaring primes? Could all of these things line up perfectly? Yeah, so it feels like I should look at um, 100 squared factorial or something. You know, put square in, see what happens. Um, and then that will have... I did then adding, really annoying. I'm going to add 17, add 18, and hope that this thing is not square free. But it's got a prime in there twice. I don't think this is like subtract something as well. I think some huge number, subtract something. Yeah, rubbish, nonsense. I reckon this should be possible. And if it's possible, we should be able to do it by clever construction, probably. If it's impossible, that would be but let's consider that briefly. You can't have it, you can have it like numbers that are not square phrasing you get. Well, can I think of two in a row? That'd be a good test, wouldn't it? Can I think of two in a row? 24 is not square free, 25 is not square, square free, that's two in a row, 26 is square free, okay, challenge accepted, let's go, um, 30, oh gosh, right, okay, looking near power, multiples of 9 feels fun, um, the powers of 2 are interesting because they give me, you know, half the numbers, uh, half the half the mul half the even numbers are not square free because the multiples are four. The other half you've got to look at their their other factors. So it's kind of fun. So there's two ways this goes, right? Either the either the the true statement is I don't know, by the way, I'm not acting. Either the true statement is no 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 no, you can't have three in a row, let alone a hundred. You can't have three in a row. That are, uh, that are not square free for like reasons or something that feels unlikely oh hang on um yeah i've had an idea um <laughs> i've had an idea i'm coming i'll come back to you in a second um and uh the alternative is uh that yeah you're sure you can generate this um, i've thought of a way to generate this Sorry, that was abrupt. I was going to lay out the two possibilities in the middle. Had had a good idea. Um, so I'm looking for n such that n, I would like n plus 1 to be a multiple uh, of 4. I'd like n plus 2 to be a multiple of 9. I'd like n plus 3 to be a multiple of uh next prime is 5 25 um that's a simultaneous set of simultaneous congruences it's three of them n is congruent to minus one mod four n is congruent to minus two mod nine n is congruent to minus three mod 25 those are k prime build it solution's huge solution is not n square factorial but it is roughly <laughs> roughly that many it feels roughly like that you take all the primes multiply them I don't know, some huge multiple of all the primes squared sort of nonsense. CRT it. Get your get your solution. That's a hundred of these to solve. And you can choose your own choose your own over here. Um, so if I'm looking for three in a row, then I should do something like this. I could start by adding zero, I suppose. Since we since we agreed that zero is yeah, um a natural number. 
Ah, that's a good point to end on. It's a good live stream where I get to have an idea. Um, especially if I have the idea in the middle of something else. Yeah, we did some CRT at the end. Um, yeah, okay. This is now closely related to another one. It's nice when the question on the sheet Should have done this faster. Um, it's nice when the question on the sheet has something to do with the course. But of course, they all have something to do with the course. Um, I think I should have looked faster for a relation between what this is. No, I had to get I had to get there like this, right? So if you if you'd put me on the spot and said, "What's this got to do with the course?" Then I'd say, ah, oh, squares, square free. We had p squared in the course a little bit. We had something like z more p squared. Maybe it's that. Like, look at the remainers more p squared. Try and find something that's a multiple of p squared. And oh gosh, generate it using the other one. If you put me on the spot to find the link to the course. Um, we had to get there in the kind of antagonistic kind of, can I find these? Can I not find these? How would I construct these? What am I asking for? And once I'd written down what I was asking for, it turned into a theme of the course. In this case, CRT. I suppose I should have been very suspicious that the position of this question is immediately after two questions about CRT and before the questions on something else. Um, so <laughs> maybe it was always going to be CRT. But it still feels like playing a game, right? Have we got to the right answer? I'm very pleased with myself. Um, although for the reasons I've just outlined, can I think quicker at this? That's the layout on the sheet. I could definitely have... Why is it introducing square free for no reason? A word that's not in the course so far. There's a famous first year question in Cambridge Maths, which if you're off to Cambridge this year, then spoilers. Um, but the structure is pretty similar. The structure is um, a number is said to be definition if definition, um, and then prove the blah, 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 blah for these numbers. Um, and the key thing is to stare at it, realize what it's asking, and then interpret that in terms of stuff from the course. <laughs> and that's not quite spoilers, in case anybody's off to Cambridge. Um, it's there to teach people about finding, you know, understanding a new definition. So exploring this was the right answer, right? We found two in a row, and then I was looking for three in a row. And that was already looking like, I think about twos and threes. Multiples of four and nine. And then the next one, in my multiple lots of things. Right, I've debugged the way that I solved it, which is something I like to do um, to kind of watch, re-watch the play-by-play -play on su successful match analysis, right? How do we have the right idea? What's it got to do with the stuff in the course was a key thing. So I'm stuck up here because I can't work out what mod 8 has got to do with the course. Haven't seen any mod 8. Haven't yet used the fabric cube as prime. Uh, the Magic Man of the Sea. That's a good use of the name, isn't it? Reminds me of the Wizard of Earth Sea. I'm serious, but it's like on the list. Where's the list of wrecks? We, we do in a second. Um, it's a serious question. Uh, uh, Wizard of Earth Sea. Uh, which is like a kind of coming of age novel about being a wizard. Um, but it's a lot more gritty. Yeah. Yeah, um, it's kind of for kids, but also just surprisingly, surprisingly gritty. Um, good. Um, what you do if you get bullied for doing maths? People suck. Uh, in the real world, in all of its different stages of life, people suck. Um, I'm going to agree with you, Trino, in a second. I'm going to get there. Um, don't let them get to you. Um, Definitely don't stop doing maths. The maths is permanent. Like, it's not going anywhere. Um, things are tough right now. Uh, I hope that in the future, maybe surrounded by different people in a different place or different time, that things are better for you. Uh, but the maths is still there. I've been trying on and off again to 
learn the fundamental theorem of arithmetic and its applications to prime number stuff for years. Um, sometimes that's been really hard, sometimes that's been more easy. Um, people come and go. Um, this too shall pass. Uh, people in chat here um, have... <laughs> <laughs> Neutrino, that is not a good summary of what I said. Hang on, I'll just look at chat and chat's like, social life is temporary, maths is eternal. <laughs> More maths practice. Oh dear. Um, so they start reciting scary numbers and refuse when asked to stop. That's what a wizard would do. Um, I also think one of, the, one of the nice things about doing maths that is sort of bully repellent is that you can do it in your head. Um, just be thinking about prime numbers and no one can really tell. Um, I'm mentioning that because, I don't know, if, you, if you'd said you were getting bullied for playing the tuba, then I'd be like, I want well, you to keep playing the tuba, but then, you know, you've got to get into school carrying the tuba, and that sounds really tough. Actually, generally being a kid is really tough, right? Um, <laughs> Somehow maths, you don't have to carry around a big tuba. That was supposed to be motivational. That's a motivational thing in there somewhere. Chat will rephrase it for me. You can do maths without carrying around a big tuba. I'm really sorry if you're also being bullied for playing the tuba. I'm probably making that worse. Cool, good. Okay. Um, something I like to say about the math streams, and we've done a couple now. This is this is kind of the third iteration, or is it fourth? Matt Livestream, Oxford Online Math Club, Quest for the Quintic, kind of a separate project, Chill Maths. This is kind of the fourth maths livestream project we're doing. Um, one of the nice things about the live streams that we're doing is that uh, nobody knows who you are. Um, find a different circle where. Find a different circle where. There aren't, the bullies aren't there. <laughs> right, cool. It's half past four. We should probably wrap up. Um, we got to do one thing. I thought this was cool. I, I almost think the example sheets are more fun and more cool than the lecture notes. Maybe it has to be like that. Oh, she is not worth it. <laughs> In my horrible opinion as a streamer. No. Oh. I don't know where you're at where you're at in life, but <laughs> I don't know where you're at in life, but there are girls out there. Uh there are girls out there who don't reject people for liking maths. They're cool. Normal people. Right, good. Yeah, that's not even a thing about math skills. That's just like normal people. Normal people. Normal people don't reject you for having an interest or for being good at something. Normal people like to see you being interested in stuff. Being a kid is, again, awful. Being a child is one of the worst things we inflict on anyone, and we inflict it on absolutely everybody. Without exception, everybody is forced to be a child for a bit. Um, yeah, no, no, normal people, normal people, a lot better than that. Oh, that's gone, is it? The stream's shutting itself down. <laughs> it's bullying me. Oh, <laughs> uh, that's people who feel threatened by you all, but mad respect. We're just, we're just having a go. Magic Man of the Sea. I'm started to feel like. Started to feel like I'm being trolled. I was warned about this. Long story short, I was warned about this by an IT technician from, from New Delhi, and they told me that I was going to be trolled on the internet. <laughs> um, chat can let me know. Um, it's going to happen quite a lot, I think. Uh, it's going to happen quite a lot. We get trolled by... or. My current policy, my current policy is whenever an IT professional... Hey, number three is your favourite. Oh, oh, yeah, number three is yeah, also cool. Um, quick check with chat on policy. Um, if somebody comes into chat 
and I think they're probably trolling. My current policy is to just play along because it's more fun. It's more fun to just be fully sincere, to be like, ah, right, you want me to factorize some complex numbers? I just I think that's more. That's how we all get to have a good time. That's my current policy. Um, if you'd like me to ever tell people to go away, I don't think I'm going to start doing that. I'm not sure. I'm not sure I'm even offering it. My current policy is to be far too naive. I think it's more fun. Um. <laughs> uh, this, the, the troll policy thing, by the way, is more of a problem on my work stream. The work stream is its more of a problem when somebody comes in and says, I've got six E's at A level. Come on, make a competitive application to Oxford. That is a very tricky question because I'm pretty sure they're trolling. But they've got me in a professional context and also had a policy of being nice. Um, so that's a challenge. It's more of a challenge than people telling me they're uh, people telling me that uh, they want me to factor some complex numbers. Right, don't all take that. Don't all take that. Don't you dare go over to the professional live stream, <laughs> the professional work live stream, and all tell me that you've got six E's in E's and A level. Don't you dare. I see you making notes on tricky questions to ask me during work. I see you. Um, <laughs> Maybe I should stop giving you the cheat codes. It'll make my life a misery. But also, I will do it in full. Oh, no, yeah, someone. I can tell there's a couple of anonymous people in the professional stream. You're here now. There's a couple of you anonymous over there who like, keep mentioning chill maths. That's good promotion, but still. How would I prove that 1 plus 1 is 2? Um, what's Wikipedia's bean rule? I want to look up that. The proof that 1 plus 1 is 2 is brilliant. Um, one thing to think about is the, the opposite, right? What would it mean for 1 plus 1 to not be 2? Which is pretty tough. Uh, what would it be if it wasn't 2? I mean, maybe 1 plus 1 could be 0? The jelly bean rule. Uh, foods cannot be claimed to be healthy unless they contain 10% of something. Wait, no, there's a Wikipedia don't stuff beans up your nose rule. In our zeal to... Oh, right, if you write rules... Okay, I see. The Wikipedia do not stuff beans up your nose rule. <laughs> this is a great page. <laughs> this is a humorous essay. If you tell people not to do something, yeah. Or maybe it's reverse psychology. Maybe I want you to tell me to stuff beans up my nose. Ooh. <laughs> Thank you for the follow. Uh, who's that from? It's do oh, Doctor. I struggle to read these. Doctor Doctor GT135. Pretty nice. Like me, got numbers on your name. What is a GT135? Is it? That's on a motorbike. Nice. It's cool. Yeah. You've got a PhD in one of those. Um, <laughs> good. Okay. Arithmetic mod 1.5 sounds like a homework task for us to try. Right, cool, okay. Uh, good -o. right, okay, good. Uh, I see people linking to the Discord again. As always, Discord is unofficial. Um, please be careful on the internet. You never know who you might meet out there, whether they are pretending to be me or not. And then other people they could pretend to be. Sounds like a weird thing. I am wrapping up, I promise. Right, cool, bye. Let's turn this off. How do I turn it off?